So we are interested in talking about like other kinds of potential partnerships that we sure. Can. Um, and otherwise, we are just really um, looking for any, any kind of um, advice on how we can direct our work. Now that you're kind of familiar with what we do and what we can offer, um, we are trying to develop um, curriculum workshops that can benefit teachers, specifically in the main um, maker design work. So is, is the goal for them to be building some of the open source uh, products that, that you all have designed? Is, um, is it to be, to be helping to develop new ones? Is it a little bit of both? Both. Nick, before we go further, would you mind if we record this? Because I'd like to see if uh, our other team members can see this as well. Are you yeah, okay sure. Not a problem. Okay. Not a problem at all. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, I think I can Absolutely. An answer that. Um, so... At this stage, we're looking for ways to spread our work and, and actually fund people doing it. So, so Sarah and Alex just emerged from our immersion program that was five weeks, and they learned how to build the 3D printers, and we're interested in teaching those kinds of workshops in different places, including to teachers and librarians. The ideal situation would be where, where we, we offer skills in design such that the printer could be used for prototyping. but. Uh, involved teachers and and everyone else, librarians, especially teachers and librarians, if they're interested in getting their students to do to work on this public interest development work of open product design. So that would be the ideal situation where we, we could hold design jams, like weekend sessions or like you know afternoon clubs that yeah. where people can get involved in actual real design for real needs. So uh, yeah. That sounds that sounds fantastic. So so you're saying so in addition to some of the things that you've already developed, like developing even like having like teachers and then by proxy their students developing other open source products that could achieve different solutions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it could be very simple things like um, a broom or some, or a tape measure, sure. or anything like simple challenges that people can take on like as a part of a club where there could even be like incentive competitions and things like that. Now one part of the work is on the heavy machines and stuff like you know the 3D printer, the CNC laser cutters and other things, heavy machines, but that's you know not everyone might, might have the facilities for doing that, but there's many ways to participate like for example scale model prototyping or doing research and other things. So right. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think that there's there's probably a couple different ways, and I'll run all of these by my, my supervisor, Josh, if there's any that um, really seem to pique your interest. Um, I just started with Digital Promise about a month ago. I used to work for Baltimore County Public Schools out, right outside of Baltimore City in Maryland. Um, yeah. I was in charge of the, the maker program there, so I, I helped to make sure that there's a maker space in each of the 170-plus elementary school, uh, 170 plus schools, so K-12, to um, and I just I moved over. I was actually involved in a in a cohort with Digital Promise as as a member as a, an employee of Baltimore County, and then have since moved over to Digital Promise. So some of the things we can do is um, based on what I know that Digital Promise has done in the past is a lot of times they'll will partner with an outside organization to provide professional development services, um, webinars in person, whatever it may be, depending on on what gets set up. Um, around really whatever whatever topic related to making is of interest to you. So it sounds like really like helping to to bring awareness to to schools and specifically teachers, and then to eventually to the students around the project that you've undertaken, and then what what they can do to help. I either start as as simply as just looking at the design process and identifying, uh, going through design thinking stages to to identify solutions to problems that people actually have and solutions to help reduce the in, in this case reduce the the cost and the um and the proprietary nature of many of these different products so how can we get around that and create things that are more openly available and easily accessible and hopefully more more inexpensive or yeah the <laughs> cheaper <laughs> there we go yeah. um and also, like one angle that we we like to teach about also is the idea of environmental issues. Because if you have built something, you can recycle it. Like for example, with a three D printer, grinder, filament maker that we're working on, uh, you can take that plastic and shred it again, and therefore you can make a lifetime product design. Yeah. 
right? So, so, so that product in particular, I just want to make sure. I, so you can take something that you've 3D printed, grind it down, and then turn it back into reusable filament. That's correct. Yep. I mean, just just that idea. Even like, th- like I think about like schools. That one of the big things for them is the the reoccurring cost of buying filament, and you only have you have a set school budget. And the number one question, so because we put a three D printer in each of our schools in Baltimore County when I was there, and the number one question that came after that we gave them the printer and some filament, and then the next question was, okay, what happens when I run out of filament? Yeah. And it was, well, you have to buy more filament. So even just like us to, to, to have and host uh, training on how to build that grinder for use in a school to help reduce the cost of filament use in, in a library, let's say, let's yeah. say the 3D printers in the library would be, I, I can imagine lots of educators would be, would be seriously interested in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that so we've got a grinder that we're using. We've got a filament maker which we haven't tested for various formulas. Like right now, we can make filament from like we've demonstrated it working from pellets that you get from. Um, you can buy pellets uh, if you get a large quantity you get them for like a like a dollar a pound or so. So with that, if you use commercial pellets, you can make your own filament because like the, the electricity cost to run the grind the filament maker are small, so you right. can make your roll of filament for like a dollar or two, you know? So oh, that's, wow. That's, that's incredible. And then free if you grind, regrind your trash. So that's... You know, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you think about all the wasted filament, the filament that you scrape off any of the... Even if you could only do it for, for, the, for the, the junk, the... Uh, I can't think of the word right now. The rafts and the supports. Right. Like you could, if, you, if you only grinded that, you would still save a ton of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, it's pretty incredible. I mean, I just seeing some of the things that you had, like the, the farm equipment was just like incredible. Yeah. 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 Appreciate that. So how do you think, um, you know, like what would be some steps like, you know, we're developing different programs, different curricula. What would be your suggestions for how we can, you know, uh, teach people and then also support our people and do that? So I think I'm, the biggest thing is always to have an ed- I think if you can always have an educator at the table, that's that's the biggest thing because as they're develop as you're developing curriculum, they're they're going to want to know what the tie is to what they're doing on a day to day basis. So let's say let's let's use the the building the filament grinder as a um as 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 the example because that's one I feel like is is pretty broadly could be broadly used in any makerspace in any school or any location. So the the initial the initial hook is yeah I'm gonna save a ton of money on the filament but then when you start looking at your scope and sequence as a teacher where is this gonna fit in my day how am I gonna tie this to the things that I still need to teach on a day to day basis so melding those two things is really one of the biggest things you do as you develop that curriculum and and helping to communicate that through professional development is gonna is really is really key and I know that's something that we've done. I, we just we uh, we've been working with another organization on doing some engineering uh, courses, and we've done like some of their professional development and and gone through their curriculum with them and done some of the curriculum development side by side with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, go ahead. Sorry. So if we talk about getting our curriculum, or like, where do we start? You know, like we we have the options. I mean, we've got a skill in house here. We I mean, we can write curriculum. Mm-hmm. But what would be most relevant? Like, what what is needed most at this point? Would you say for like if we were to work with Digital Promise and and have you guys maybe collaborate with us on helping us create this curriculum? I think I think the biggest thing. I'm getting a little bit of a. So am I. Uh, Recording is on. Yeah, uh, did that clear up? Sorry. Still, echo still on? Or? Can you, can yeah, you hear me? Yeah, can you hear I could, me? could hear you. It's, it's on echo is, Let's see, maybe I can mute myself. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Um, see if it's better. Mute in between. <laughs> no, I, I think <laughs> uh, it disappeared right now. Oh, there we go. Good. There we go. Okay. 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 There we go. I was afraid it was me. Um, so I think that the biggest thing is is 
rooting it in in design. One of the big things that we do with digital promise is we root it in design thinking. We root we, we root things in in student agency and why why are they doing it? so? Who is developing student agency? Who's the audience? Like taking those things into consideration is really what we bring to the table. Tying it to standards as appropriate. Helping to facilitate the professional learning is another big thing that we do. Um, working side by side to look at at the curriculum development, what do the assessment pieces look like? All of those things are are really what are, would would fall into our wheelhouse in terms of what what Digital Promise can provide. So, like I was saying, uh, there's another organization that we've been working with um, that that we've been doing. A lot of that. In addition, I just like I said, I started about a month ago, so that's the one that I've been working with most recently. What's, I don't know what I, <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to say or not, so that's why I'm not saying ah. it. it. It's a it's a big one, a big social media company. Um, so that should hopefully narrow it down. <laughs> so, um, but okay. um, but yeah, so we've been working side by side with them to to help um, build their curriculum out. Uh, work with them as they as they design and develop, and then actually co-facilitate the professional development. So I led a webinar like a week or so ago, and we've been continuing support. Um, on our end, we also have a research team that can can do any research work that goes along with that. Um, like they're doing like site visits and and looking at the the programmatic structures in place and the impact on um, engineering curriculum reaching. Uh, uh, students that maybe don't typically get access to these types of things, so that that's where a lot of that work has been. And, and like I said, we we basically co-develop and consistently meet with them. I, I'd say I meet with them two or three times a week and work with them two or three times a week in addition to the other things that are on my plate um, to make sure that we are are developing something that's really impactful. Right. Uh, when you say professional development, do you mean continuing education credits for teachers? So the micro credential uh, section uh, department of Digital Promise is really where that comes in. So that can certainly be be a component of it. So like we, so I'm also so like our team, for example, developed a um, a maker learning. Uh, it's a deeper deeper learning through making is I believe what it's called um, course that we're that we're doing hosting on Edmodo, um, and. It's professional development that we've put together, and any teacher can go through it. But they have to, if they wanted the micro credential, the associated micro credential for it, um, they can apply for that and do that as well. But in in fit, in the case of what we've been doing with the engineering product, it's just been about professional development. Like we ran a professional development webinar on how to get started with that program, mm -hmm. and. Um, work with the teachers who signed up for that webinar and came to it to help them. How do they sign up? How do they navigate the course? What's the impact supposed to be? Um, all of those types of things are, are the services that we've, that we've been providing them. Do you have a link to this deeper learning through making? Like, can we actually take a look at that? So uh, let me see if um, I don't know if it's you should be able to at least see it. I don't know if I mean if if you can see it, that would be all you'd really need to do. I don't think you have to enroll in it. Um, I'm gonna try and copy and paste the link. I don't know, and if this doesn't work, what I can do is I can see if I can get permission to just add you to it so that you can see it. Um, where is, there we go. Is there a chat in here? Here we go. Yeah, there is. There we go. So I'm not sure if that'll work. It, uh, does this have screen share? Because if it doesn't, I can also bring it up yeah. on screen share. It does have screen share next to that chat okay. button there. Yeah, there we go. So see if that works first. And if it doesn't, then I can do a quick screen share for you. It looks like the beta at Moto. Let's see, is it booting up? Right. Um, is it saying it's locked? It says login. Yeah, it says login. Yeah, so it'll probably. So what I'll do is I will share my screen. Okay. Uh, I have to add the the Chrome extension. <laughs> yep. Um. Okay. So can you see it now? Yeah, I got it. Mm -hmm. Yep. So so you can see it, it's broken out into different modules. Each module is designed to take 
So the course runs, it's it's going to run basically from September to December. So mm-hmm. they have that amount of time to go through this whole course. So they have their introduction section where they all kind of have a place and they're, uh, to introduce themselves. Um, there's a collaboration space as well. Um, and then basically each model is broken down into um, engage, investigate, and uh, act. So they go through and they actually participate. So this is, I think, it looks like this is the... Old, this is the older version, uh, which is the same. I just there's one that that just started, so this is la- the last one. So you can see there's video content that's been developed um, that takes them through what it means to to embrace creative thinking and innovating in the classroom. So they spend some time brainstorming on that. You can see right here they actually have the ability to link it to those micro credentials. So for example, if you were to um, decide you wanted not only offer a professional development session, but like go through the process of like creating some sort of micro-credential that goes along with it, that's something that can be investigated as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so you see that they go through this and then they come down and they investigate and they actually start doing some of the research around it and, and looking at what it would look like in practice and starting to develop solutions. And then they actually move into the uh, process of, in, of actually implementing what it is that they've done, and then they provide their findings. They they take they take what they have and actually use it to like actually like hone in on it and identify actual solutions to what yeah. they've been trying to do in their classroom. Is this a paid course? The teachers sign up at a fee, or is so, it just so just for the it's, credentials? It's a, yep. So it's a it's a paid course. But if the um we we partner with Maker Ed, which is based out in Oakland. Um, Maker Ed, Recording has stopped. Uh, Maker Ed um, and Digital Promise have partnered on something called the the Maker Promise, and it's basically for any school. It can be a teacher, a school, like a school administrator, uh, or a school district, all the way up to a superintendent can sign the Maker Promise. So the course itself is fifty dollars, but if you sign the Maker Promise, you get access to the course for free. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then, so if you so would actually, yeah. Go ahead. So, so you're saying that that if. If that now to get credential, like continuing education training credits, people, the teachers would have to pay for that. That's a totally separate thing. Or yeah, so the micro credential has a different, has an associated cost with it, and and some of them work towards like graduation credits, and some of them don't. It depends on the school system. It depends on who, like the, the way. Like speaking from my experience, when I was with Baltimore County, you you had the if you were creating something that you wanted for continued professional development or your continued education credits. You had to, it had to be written out in a certain way. Um, you had to get approval from the state Department of Education mm-hmm. for it to be considered something that would that would qualify for it. So, like in the state of Maryland, for example, any anything that um, anything that qualifies for an MSDE, which is the Maryland State Department of Education cr- uh, credit, could then apply towards not necessarily graduate credit, but towards your continued education. You needed five of those a year. If it was something that existed outside of that pool of just CPD credits, like for example, if I went to a local university and took something, those graduate level credits could apply as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. once they're digital promise, depending on which one it is, usually the teacher would need to check with, or we would work with school systems to say like, hey, like these may, these credentials most likely ma- match up with, with what would qualify and maybe these don't. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, so, if I, I would say, like, one thing we can do at this point, so we we can uh, do well on the three D printers, like teaching people how to build them in a single day. That's one of the like the workshop offerings that we taught, for example, Alex and Sarah to do is is how do you run a workshop where you can go through a complete build, and that's that's on a rapid time scale where we present a kit and then the teachers or anyone builds them builds that throughout the day. Uh, do you think something like that would be valuable to teachers in terms of offering like Im- immersion around one day builds or it could be like a couple day build where we can include uh, training on how do you design CAD files and basic design thinking? Um, what are your thoughts on that? So there's always a benefit in that technical training. Like I, I'll never forget, I went um, to one of the local space makerspaces in Baltimore, and we did like a three day build of two CNC routers. Mm-hmm. And I knew that router better than I knew any other piece of equipment because I yeah. put it together with my own hands. And I think there's real value in that. And I think that 
once teachers get over the initial fear of having to put that together themselves, they realize how much more intimately connected they are to it because of the fact that they put it together themselves. I think there's also always a demand for for technical training. Um, I think that it's it, that level is a very specific level um, mm -hmm. because you, you have to want someone who's you, you have to find someone who's comfortable enough to get in there and do that um, or create the conditions so that they they are comfortable with it. Um, yeah, we certainly do some technical training, but for the most part, ours is more on the on the learning experience side. So for us, it would be like, how can how do we take that experience mm -hmm. and turn it into something that better helps the teachers to understand what making is and how it impacts instruction. So like pairing it with like looking at like, if you've ever seen like parts, purposes and complexities of, of different items um, and like looking at the 3D printer as a whole and then breaking it down into the granular pieces and how they each impact the overall product can serve as an analogy for how they create curriculum, how they create lessons and those types of things and how they can engage students in those same thought processes. I think there's a lot of value in that. Would there be any any teachers that actually want? I mean, how would you see the, for example, the three D printer? If we can teach the teacher, what would they do with it? Would they teach their students about? Well, that's that, and things, that's or? that's the question. So right, so the technical piece and the how do I use it is is the baseline for the teacher. Really, it's okay. Now I understand how this is going to work. Then that next. The really more, more really the more important question is, okay, I know how to use this. What does this mean for my students? Yeah. And that's where you really get into the design thing and like what are what are the things that not necessarily what are the things that my kids can make with it, but like what are the thought processes that they're gonna go through yeah. and what are they gonna try yeah. to solve with a 3D printer? So like some of our schools that we worked with, um, like they were they started off very, very simply with taking files that were provided to mm -hmm. them from charities that do like prosthesis and and make like the prosthetic arms that and the hands that you can that have the wire to on them and when they bend they can they can grasp and then that then turned into okay how do i then take that and how do i how do i take what i've learned from that to solve another problem maybe it's an iteration on this that we've made that we took their cookie cutter materials or their cookie cutter plans and how to what is the design process that I have to go through to improve upon that? Yeah, that's where yeah. you get the teachers. That's where they start to see like, oh, okay, like I can, I can do this. Like, there's, there's your baseline things like taking models that were already created, or yeah. even like, I'm gonna have like we're learning about this in social studies. We're learning about like ancient relics, and they're obviously can't get their hands on them, but if they can design it in three in CAD software and print it out, now we have the ability to see it. Yeah. And hold it. Yeah. So let me tell you about um, one thing that we do, like the way we think about things. So in the work of open source ecology, we talk about changing the economy towards open source production. But like unlike the fab labs, which kind of talk about elite design and this amazing capacity, kind of like for heroes, we're talking about the concept of what you might call like a, the Xerox machine for local production. So that means common things like here's common household goods or like you know a cell phone like a simple modular cell phone or something like that digital camera a drone another 3d printer like like useful things and and common things like a brush or like a broom or something um do you think that we could enlist like teachers would be interested in in um teaching their students about participating in a process so we kind of this what we call public design and would that be something interesting to pitch to them as, as I think that's the I think that's the route you go. I think that the technical comes with it, like okay, like we like they're gonna have to three D okay. print, like or like let's build a three D printer and then oh, yeah. we can talk about all the stuff we can do with a three D printer. But I think the real hook for you yeah. is introducing that idea of public design and of creating something that's easier and cheaper to make and use for the greater good uh -huh. and taking the ideas that you you have and what you've done and enlisting the teachers and the students of the world to grow and expand that idea oh yeah as we oh yeah. yeah as we as we as we become a more global society 
these are the solutions that we need. If, if we leave it to corporations, oh, yeah. we're going to get expensive. Propri- I mean, you, you say it yourself in, 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 in the TED Talk, you leave it to the corporations. You're, you're leaving it open to be, you're leaving it to be expensive and expensive to purchase and then expensive to maintain. Yeah. But yeah. if I, if I can make my own hairbrush when it breaks, I just make, I make another one. Mm-hmm. When it, when it snaps in half, I use the tools that I already have to meld it back together. Those types of things. I think that's where I think that you can. I think you can take it from a from a opening it up to the entire world angle. I think you can take it from a sustainability angle. I think there's a million different ways that you can introduce this concept. I lo- I mean, the concept itself is is incredible, mm-hmm. and the the more you can get that into the hands and the heads of kids. The more oh, yeah. they're going to realize that the impact they can have, even from their schoolmaker space. I love it, Alex and Sarah. Do you guys got any comments on that? Because I think I think that kind of hit the the core position. I think we can take. Yeah, that's really all great to hear. And uh, Nick, I'm so glad to hear you have this background with the Baltimore school system and in maker spaces and bringing students in there. And um, that's all really great to hear. I've been yeah, just taking notes on. Um, what you're sharing with us. Um, Great. The idea of enlisting students and teachers of the world to expand our work, it, that's exactly what we're trying to do. Yeah. You know? So how... Teams, yeah. What we need is to be able to take this on, to, to grow the, you know, what we're doing, but also because it's so valuable to them and for kids in the school. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Nick, I mean, what do you think, uh, so what would be our next step if, say, we want to propose i mean that's that's what i think would be ideal is okay we ha- we have some tools but the bigger thing is getting people involved involved in a public design process that could be uh, uh, could, that could turn into a social movement uh, yeah so, absolutely um so how do you think we should begin that so i think on your end i think kind of thinking through just the beginnings of the broad strokes Mm-hmm. that you want and while you're doing that on my end i'm gonna run it up because i don't like like i said i just i started a month ago so mm-hmm. now that we've had this initial conversation i'm gonna run it by my my supervisor he's at our um we we have an organization within digital promise that we call the league of innovative schools mm-hmm. where it's a network of over a hundred schools around the united states mm-hmm. um that are really doing innovative things and our, that convening hmm. is today through Friday so mm-hmm. he's there I know he's checking email but I don't know what the frequency is but I'm gonna send him an email as soon as we're done here and see what would have to happen our, on our end to move forward with creating a partnership mm-hmm. yeah 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 that would be great um, so I see League of Innovative Schools Digital Promise um, yep. I can take yeah make a note of that yeah, so it's a really it's a really great network of it's 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 interesting because it's actually not based on the school system, it's based on the superintendent. So obviously the person driving the vision for that school system. And what's great about that, because I'll give you an example, is with Baltimore County Public Schools, we were in the league. Um, but then our superintendent left and then unfortunately then got himself arrested, but that's neither here nor there. Mm-hmm. Um, but we were in the league and when we left, when he left, we were no longer in the league. Because they want to make sure that they have that commitment from the top that that they're committed to innovative practice in their schools. So, mm-hmm. like, I can just imagine even, like, running this by and saying, like, some, some of our league schools that would be interested mm-hmm. in, like, being, like, kickoff partners for this. But, again, I'm just kind of – I'm just – my brain starts running 100 million miles a minute when I hear an awesome idea like this. So yeah. I'm going to start – I'm going to start with talking – I'm going to start with talking to Josh and see what the next steps on our end would be. And then what I'll okay. do is I'll, I'll use that same email thread that we've had going for the past few days, and I'll get back in touch with you as soon as I hear him and maybe bring him into the conversation if need be. Excellent, excellent. Now, what is the typical – do you know what the typical partnership process looks like with digital products? I, I don't, and that's one of the things that I have to, I'm going to have to clarify with him. This is, Like I said, this is my first time having one of these introductory conversations, okay. so I'm going to make sure – I don't want to misspeak and say something wrong, so I'm going to I'm gonna defer to him and make sure that I'm getting you all the right information. Awesome. But I, I do know we have a number of partnerships with a number of outside organizations, so oh. I know it's something – we're always looking to do. Yeah, and and so you'd see this going in the direction. Okay, let's develop this curriculum and frame it as curriculum for teachers to bring into high into their schools. 
Yeah, curriculum, curriculum, it, it, it might be. And there's a couple of different ways we could do it. It could be, it could be a rote curriculum. It could be a, a, a thematic toolkit, so to speak, where maybe they're not, it's not a day to day, but it's more like, how do I, how do I take this idea of open source solutions to the world's problems and to things that people need and this open source economy? And how do I apply that to things that we're learning about? Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple different avenues that we can take. I think that we should, once we, um, once I get a better sense from Josh, then I think we can kind of hone in on exactly. And I certainly, certainly don't, I, I encourage, I certainly encourage you guys to think about that as well and think yeah. about the different types of things because there's positives and negatives to both. If you, if you put a curriculum out there, there's the, there's always the, you, you can put together really good linear, uh, content. But then there's this feeling that you kind of have to, unless it's developed in a very specific way, that it's kind of um, meant to be implemented with fidelity. Whereas if you do something like a product toolkit or a project toolkit, mm -hmm. you can have a bunch of materials that support these ideas and professional development around the, th the theme, but you don't necessarily provide a specific curriculum. Mm -hmm. Or you could have a range. You could say for, for schools that are all in and have the time to, to dedicate to a full curriculum, here's what we offer in that, or we don't have the time for that because we need to make sure we need to address X, Y, and Z, but we can see how this would fit in with specific units of study that we already do, and how can we weave this idea of the open source economy into what we're already learning. Yeah, yeah. Tell me a little bit more about the toolkit. So what do you see, like, it's not specific curriculum, but what, what like, uh, guidelines or... Guidelines, video resources, um, work like I, I hate to not the term I hate the term worksheets, but like, like models and examples of like examples of curricular integration. So like not necessarily doing the work of doing the curriculum integration, but how do we um, how do we provide opportunities to embed this idea of making an open source economy. How, how can I embed them into my math class or into my civics class? Um, those are the things that, like, they're more general. So if you take a look, we actually, um, if you look on the Digital Promise website for the Maker Learning Leadership Framework, you'll see a but that, that is a toolkit we put together all around maker learning and being a leader in the maker learning realm. Um, you could, that, that's a good example of what a toolkit would look like. Just a, a, a number of resources around a number of different topics related to being a leader in the maker learning area. Yeah, yeah. As far as and there might there might even be some stuff in there that you could you can pull from because that's all open source. We have editable documents. There might even be some content within that maker learning leadership framework that might might pique your interest. Might might you might want to remix or use to like spur on uh, other ideas for us to work on. Yeah, yeah. So let me ask you about the actual 3D printer builds. If, um, so you offer curriculum for continuing education, but beyond that, if it's just like, does it have to be where, where teachers are getting credit or are there other informal ways where, where teachers just take continuing education without credit? Sure. Sure. So we have a number of different things that we do, and it, it depends on, I think, I guess, a lot of different factors. So, for example, that Edmodo course that I showed you, yeah. if they if they don't do one of the CPD credits, mm -hmm. then um, with the, I'm sorry, if they don't do one of the micro credentials, they don't get anything. They just get the benefit of being enrolled in the professional development and learning more. Um, so, there, so there's a range like that. It's like I can sign up and do this and either pay the $50 for the experience or sign the maker promise for the experience. Um, and they do it and that's it. Um, or they can do it and they can say like, not only am I going to do this, but I'm going to pay for the associated micro credential so that I can have this digital badge that shows my, um, my prowess in this particular area. Yeah, yeah. Now, do schools typically have a budget for for paying for their teachers to get curriculum and continuing training? Uh, so so it, it, it's, it varies from district to district. So uh, again, I'll use Baltimore County as my frame of reference because I was, I was both in the classroom and in central office there. Mm -hmm. So the school budget, um, if they have, for example, if they have Title I money, they always have money for professional development. So they always have money, like federal funds to bring people in 
to do additional training. Um, most of the trainings that we offered, um, typically what we did was we would we would pay for some of our central office staff and some of our lead teachers throughout the school system, like some of our rock stars, to attend trainings, and then um, they would then uh, it would be like a train the trainer model where they would train. We would, uh, the organization would train the central office people, mm -hmm. and then the central office people would turnkey that to spread that message throughout the school system. Right. No, that's that's nice. Uh, so, but there are some 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 small some smaller school systems. They control all of their funds, and they get to decide what they go out, and they and they spend. It really it, it varies from district to district. Right. So if we can deliver a one day build of the three D printer, or like longer versions too with other content uh, but just for to say that one day build uh, do you have any suggestions on like if teachers would be interested in how to go about promoting that I mean so I think that I think that again I think that a lot of teachers who are engaged in making and ready to take that next step to like like I said develop a more intimate relationship with the with the tools that they're using, I think it's one thing. Like I said, to go out and, and buy a um, a consumer grade or even a prosumer grade uh, 3D printer, it's another thing to build it with your own hands and really know how to fix every single piece of it. Um, I, I certainly think there's a market for that. It's definitely a smaller market than like your intro to 3D printing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think it's definitely because because it is a scary thing, right? Like you're building this thing that builds things. Mm -hmm. Um, how do and that could be scary. Yeah. Well, how do we uh, address that part? Like, you know, because, yeah, obviously it's scary for a lot of people. How do you think we could address that? Like, say we're presenting this as an offering for teachers. How would we go about that? I think that the best way to do it and the way that we've kind of talked about is that you, you only get a part of the experience when you buy the 3D printer and you just start using it. Um, when, you, when you build it with your own hands, you understand it better. You, you know how to troubleshoot it and fix it. Because I think about like the teachers, the emails that I would get from teachers. It said like, my 3D printer is clogged. I don't know what to do. Or the extruder head's not moving. I don't know what to do. And they would have a much better understanding of what mm -hmm. to do and what parts they would need and how to fix it if they had built it themselves. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Yeah, because we're, you know, I'm, I'm like curious if, like, would that be something outside of Digital Promise in terms of trying to get those specific workshops out to teachers? Or I don't do think you have any other. I don't think necessarily. I don't necessarily. I, I mean, I'll certainly, like I said, I'll run it by, run it by my supervisor yeah. and see, see what his thoughts are on it. But I don't, I don't necessarily know that that's outside of the scope of the work. Mm -hmm. Um. But I, but I do want to double check before I give you a firm answer. Yeah. So what would be most useful for what we can do on our side right now? I think the biggest thing is like, is is taking some of the ideas that we've talked about, so that the technical training and really the the, the more the more broad focus of how do we introduce the idea of an open source economy into schools and kind of thinking about the different approaches that you want to take from there. I'm hoping the turnaround isn't too long so that we can maybe have another conversation in a few days so that okay. you're not left with without much direction. But but that's where I'd start. I'd really start with that. Like mm -hmm. not necessarily on the build. I think the builds builds are a part of it. Um, but I really think it's I think the the real the real content that you have here is this idea of building something to make it more broadly available and to make it easier for anyone anywhere to get access with it because the parts are all easily findable and and can be put together in a way that that anyone can do it mm -hmm. so think about so for us to think about um uh just draft it up as what as ideas or proposal for how yeah just like just to think like about I, I i i almost say like take your ted talk and take it and break it into what you think the teachable pieces are. Like, if you were to stand in front of 30 kids, what would you want them to most understand about the impact of it? And then what, go, what are some of the things that go along with that? Like, 
what is the economic impact? What's the social impact of those things? Because that's really where you're going to start the teaching. You're going to start the teaching with like the why. Like, why does it matter that that the cost has come down and that I can build right. a 3D printer myself? And you start with that, and then you get into like, okay, like now that we've done that, now let's start building some stuff. Like what? Like mm-hmm. thinking like, and then helping the teachers and the students to start thinking locally. And then like, how does that scale globally? Like we have this problem here. In, like I think about um, kids and uh, there's a, a group of kids in Baltimore city that built an app that runs on any smart device and on any computing device. They call it the bat. It's, it's a terrible thing that they've had to invent, but they call it the bad batch app. It's basically an alert system that they built that can be replicated in other cities that um, that people can submit when somebody has received a bad batch of drugs that has caused an overdose. Oh, wow. So they can immediately, yeah, so they can, it's, it's, a, it's a terribly morbid genius idea, but it's to help raise awareness in the community. Like, oh my God, like I bought this the other day and somebody had an overdose, like, or, or it, it was cut with something, and I need to make sure that I don't use this because I'm afraid that's going to happen to me too. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a genius idea born from a very real circumstance in that particular area of the city, and it's something that can be replicated in other areas. They don't, the, the, code, is not, the code is not proprietary, so... Yeah, yeah. So well, the, yeah, go ahead. yeah, I was going to say, what are your thoughts on if you know, part of this is how do you make impact? And it's obviously about people becoming more entrepreneurial, uh, starting to make money outside the corporate sector to do to get the life that they really want. Do you think that pitching this, okay, so you, now you can develop certain open source project products and and would that be attractive to students as far as pitching it as, okay, here's tons of common household goods or common objects that you can start making. Uh, do you think that part has appeal to students? And teachers? Yeah, I think, I, so I think the best thing you can do is offer, offer a range. Like, especially like if you say, like, I, I start, you can start with the problem or you can start with a solution that you want to iterate on and either, like you said, make it cheaper or make it, make it, uh, more impactful and if you offer those branches you're gonna hit most kids right you're gonna say like okay like how do i make this ten dollar brush out of two dollars in materials yeah uh, what about the actual aspect of we're saying hey uh, stu- students if you do this that's actually a, a good revenue opportunity i mean would that right. be yeah I, I, yeah of course okay of, of course and i think anytime you can tie revenue and social impact together is is where you get you get the biggest bang but like yeah absolutely saying like yeah like if you can if you can do this in a way that's that's cheaper like you can undercut the big corporations no oh, yeah that's that's cool <laughs> yeah sounds good um so alex and sarah do you guys have any more uh, questions what are your thoughts hi um alex um no, I think that sounds good. Yeah, yeah. So I think no, this is I think really productive. Uh, a lot of a lot of good insights. So definitely want to follow up and um, yeah, see what what your supervisors uh, Josh says about that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I'm gonna knock out an email to him right now and hopefully be back to you all within a day or two. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Oh, that's that sounds pretty good to me. Great. Okay. I will I will chat with you all soon. Okay. Well, Nick, thanks so much for your time. Of course, this was my pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Bye, guys. Bye, bye. Yeah. So Alex and Sarah. So Jen is still on. Jen. Um, so Jen is one of the Dev Team members, and she was Jen. Maybe uh, actually, if I can ask you, because you were talking about uh, one thing is homeschoolers as a particular uh, target market for the three D printers. Jen, can you comment more on that? Because because we had that discussion, we never really took that further. Yeah, we didn't we didn't go anywhere with this, and you know I'm sidetracked by being a full time student now. Sorry about the chainsaws in the background. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, there there are a lot of homeschool programs. There's at least three I can think of off the top of my head in Alaska who provide up to two thousand two thousand or more per year per student. And if we integrate the parts of the 3D printer into a program into like a class, like they won't they might not pay necessarily for hardware. The homeschool programs around the country they're less likely to pay for hardware. But if the hardware is integrated into a package that includes a build, 
then they will pay for it. And I think that we really need to market it to that. I kind of dead ended on that because I'm like not in the homeschool groups anymore and I've got so much going on. I haven't had time to like really get back into that. Yeah. Uh, but, and there, if, if we put together, if we put together a build, you know, some kind of, some kind of package to sell, then I can um, contact different homeschool programs about it. And it's and a lot of homeschooling is about self-reliance and about like even even the Luddites will use 3D printers huh. because the whole, the whole thing is to um, yeah, let me get out of this room is to is to um, be self-reliant you know and a lot of like like the extreme crafters even would be in 3D printer yeah 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 no definitely you know as, in, Jen, yeah. as far as the, what you mentioned about the homeschool programs, are you talking about those are funding sources for homeschoolers? Yes, 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 yes. When I um, when I had three kids in homeschool, I got nearly six thousand dollars a year to spend on book supplies programs. Uh, most of it went to hockey. Uh huh. You know, we got we had free, they they most provide free internet. They provide computers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh -huh. That's that's how I know so much. I spent ten years online in a cabin in Alaska, just looking stuff up for the kids to do things. Yeah. So for so, would you say that we would come like go to homeschooling groups and pitch them a program where us walking them through the actual application for those grants would be part of that, or how do you see this working? I would I would approach the programs directly. I wouldn't I wouldn't approach like okay, so states fund homeschooling programs. Mm-hmm. So, so what, like yeah, let's see if you're a real person, Jen. Yeah, so you I'm are. a real person. You're not, you're not just an AI bot. That's great. Right. <laughs> if I have black eyes, it's his. Yeah. <laughs> Jen, so let me ask you this. So, so for those programs, you're saying go to them and what? Uh, but we're not oh. a homeschooler, so what do we say to no, them? No, no, no. They, um, okay, so for example, Idea and Connections have um, what they call either like certified or verified vendors or registered vendors. So if we're a vendor with them, then the people that are in the homeschool program don't have to have cash out of pocket. They can they can order the thing through the program. Like I got all kinds of stuff from Lawrence Labs for my kids. You know, mm -hmm. in Berkeley. Um, because they were they were a certified vendor for the homeschool programs I was in. Yeah. Like I can tell you some crazy Malthusian stuff they're pushing in the public schools. Um because you get the teacher's guides and they don't know better than to send them to the homeschoolers. You're you're in Oregon right now, right? I'm in Washington. I'm in Seattle. And I'm finally meeting tech people. Okay, that's cool. Huh. Yeah. Okay. So what do you think, like, if, you know, if we're doing different marketing work, market development and product development for the homeschoolers, what would you suggest our next step would be right now then? Um, actually, we, we, need to, um, we need to gather information gather information on, on what okay so so what we need and i don't know how much time i really have to do this um we need to find out which states have which homeschooling programs what their requirements are for providing funding for for resources like what their max is um some some homeschooling most of the maximum limitations are on art and pe mm -hmm. you know ostensibly we should be able to put together um Without me doing research, we should be able to put together an $800 or $1,000 build, and that would be sellable. We'd have to build a curriculum around it, and I'm thinking about open sourcing the curriculum around it. Sure. You know, and you can build uh, – how many curriculums can you build around a 3D printer build? About a million. Everything, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's like the foundation of civilization. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you'd say we, we look at – Specifically, so we're looking at, is there like state offices, like uh, how do you Google that? You Google homeschooling programs for a given state. Yeah, you might have to do it state by state, you know, be like, I'm in Oregon, I want to homeschool. Mm -hmm. And then they would give you the homeschool programs and you would contact the homeschool programs individually. And when you, you say know, homeschool I, program, you mean a program that funds homeschoolers? Yes, and it would, it would, it would stay certified homeschool program, so, you know, the stats, you don't come get you. Mm -hmm. Because you dare to, you dare to, to influence your own children. God mm. forbid. <laughs> yeah. Huh. So homeschool programs, state certified programs, and these are these are. Tell me more about these programs. So they're typically organizations that provide. 
Yeah. They're government. They're generally government funded. They generally go district by district. For example, in um, in Alaska, Idea is out of the Galena School District, which is basically North Pole, Alaska. But it turned into a statewide program, so anyone in the state can get funding through Idea. But if you want like the the public school resources, you have to be in the Galena School District. But Idea is like one of the better homeschool programs. Or more, you do what you want to do kind of thing. Connections mm -hmm. was other homeschool program. It's in the um, Kenai Peninsula Borough. And the thing with um, Connections is that, you know, each homeschool program is a little bit different on what they emphasize. Connections was more public school teachers. They didn't require that their, that their liaison teachers had ever homeschooled. So Connections was like public school at home, but they still paid for a lot of things. And Connections, you had to go through like somebody, like an authority to say, yes, you can spend money on this. But then I got Stratego and Rome Total War paid for when my kids wrote essays on how it's historical. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Idea had pre-certified vendors, and if you went to a vendor, they'd pay, and if you um, went out of pocket, they'd reimburse you. Huh. So how competitive are homeschool programs? D does Like when you apply, are you likely to get that support as a homeschooler, homeschool teacher? Oh, yeah, 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 it's not, it's, you don't have to apply to be in a homeschool program. I mean, it would be, like in Alaska, it's not like there's a certain number who can do it. it anybody who wants to homeschool can homeschool anywhere in Alaska. And you guarantee awesome. that you get so much money from these homeschool programs? Yes. Yes. Huh. Each program has a different amount. They, they get allocated from the state. So the program's making money, but then ostensibly they provide services and free resources. So but, they're, they're um, making like they, hand, they're, they're taxpayer money, so these homeschool programs? Yeah, they're, they're, government, they're government programs out of school districts. Their scopes are different mm -hmm. based on how the program works. I'm, I'm not talking about private homeschool programs. They don't know anything about that. But they get like X number of dollars per student, just like any public school does, and then they out and then they allocate funds to parents, kind of on like you know how much we have to give the parents to get them to pick our program. Wait, but tell me the distinction between public homeschool programs versus private ones. What is that? Uh, I I don't know anything. About, okay, so like a private homeschool program would be something like um, here's my history, Sunlight, which is a Christian homeschool program. And they don't, I, I think you can pay and get grading services, I don't know. But you just like order your things through them and you do and you do your thing. And the public homeschool programs is you go, you go apply, it, you, you enroll, it's not apply, it's enroll. When you enroll for school, you enroll in the homeschool program instead of in the local public school, you enroll in the homeschool program. And then you have a contact teacher and you have to check in every month and you have to, you have to turn grades. That's a public homeschool program, a private homeschool program would be you just pay money and the state can F themselves. But they don't give you money. But public, there's there's paid homeschool programs in a lot of states. We well, you make money just off Alaska. So you're saying like uh, for the homeschool programs, um, these are where, does that have to do with like, you get like linked to state curriculum or it's totally independent still? Uh, you, yeah, you can get, you can get state curriculum, absolutely. Now, I mean, what's the distinction there? Like, do you do they have like full homeschool curriculums from the state? And like, did you use that, or do you just make your own? Oh, I mean, it's taking up themselves. I, yeah, the first the first month I was in homeschool, I followed the state curriculum, and I developed a hatred for math in my third grader that is still there. Wow. <laughs> you know, so uh -huh. yeah, no, you do. You, the, the idea is that you is that you customize the teaching to your child, uh -huh. and the state curriculum is available because legally it has to be available to every parent. Period, no matter what. Just uh -huh. like free school lunch. Wow. <laughs> it's like you know, there's you know, there's a lot of things they don't tell you that you, the state's obligated to provide. Huh. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Uh, do you suggest also going after private homeschool programs? I mean, is that some complete no, because people have to pay in private homeschool programs. There's no, I mean, yeah, it, yeah, but then it's not going to be like, it's not going to, they're going to have to be able to tag money on to what we're providing. And the thing is with the state homeschool uh -huh. programs, they directly to us with money the state gives them. Private homeschool programs, they'd be paying through the private homeschool program to us. You know, they need to woo us for that. Huh. So you're saying, for example, Alaska, they guarantee you like $2,000 a year? For a student, for your own yeah. child, yeah, it's close. Yeah, it's close to that now. It started at like about a thousand. When they get into high school, it's more money. But I think it's two thousand a year now. Okay. Yeah. I was like, I never paid for hockey. I never paid for hockey. We never paid for any. You know, we had computers, internet, hockey, uh, riding lessons. Uh huh. Um, now, yeah. is that like if 
so if we're vying for that, what's the competition like when the the parents they're going to be competing with like getting books for other subjects or what? Like, is there stiff competition or or you think they? Well, it, it, you just have to make your curriculum. Just make. You have to make your so curriculum valuable. available. The thing is, is that there are so many artistic kids and so many um, special needs kids, and three D printing is just like, like the whole techie three D printing. You're building this stuff. That's exactly where it needs to be. They want people to be, you know, mm -hmm. like the kids aren't learning out of books anymore. It's not working. Right. 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 No, exactly. And the internet's free. Most homeschool programs provide internet. So you're not competing with books. You're not competing with websites. That's free. Yeah. We're, we're competing, you know, we're competing with like hockey, football, basketball, um, art supplies, scrapbooking. Yeah. That's what we're competing with. Um, chemistry sets. Okay. Cool. cool. Base so, camp. So you said. That's what we're competing with. Okay. So you said next. But you can use base camp and get a 3D printer with $2,000. Yeah. Cool. And there's so, no limit on science. It's a science. Yeah. So, are, Jen, would you say that we're pursuing just simply individual homeschool uh, moms and dads, and that's that's our client, right? But we're going to the programs themselves to put ourselves as essentially approved vendors, or yeah, that's that's basically because, it. Okay. This is this this is why because a lot of people who are homeschooling. But they've got it. They've got one parent working at night and one working during the day, so there can always be somebody home with the kids because we homeschool, so we don't have to turn our kids over to the state. Not everybody's going to take the economic hit that I took to homeschool their kids. Like I was, I, I, I someday I will tell you how poor I was. But, um, but the idea is, is that we want it to be as easy as possible for people to choose our three D printer and to have it have it paid for ahead of time. If if. If we get approved vendors, then it's already paid for. All the parent has to do is order it. They don't have to think of what they're going to come up with the money. Right. The schools are coming up with the money. But if we're not approved vendors, if we're not if we're not going through the homeschool program, if we're just attaching to parents, mm -hmm. then they're they're not getting it paid for. Right. They have to figure out how to come up with the money. So mm -hmm. I would start with getting to be an approved vendor. You get to be an approved vendor, you say we have this product. Mm -hmm. This is this is what we've got. And then once you're an approved vendor, then you sell to the parents. Be becoming an approved vendor is free. Okay. Okay. Huh. You know, it's do just you, you fill out the paperwork. Yeah. So yeah. do you have contacts for any of these people who work at this, this deal of uh, the homeschool programs? Like any of those contacts that we can actually work with or converse more with to get more um, in what they need? Yeah, I can, I, can, I can send you the information on the homeschool programs in Alaska. Mm -hmm. um, they they need a I have some emails that went back and forth that I needed some information. How much is a flight ticket to Alaska? Is that prohibitive or is that like we can go to? No, Alaska? I no I I used to fly back and forth for under two hundred dollars mm -hmm. one way. I don't think that's bad. Huh. So so uh, what are your thoughts and people, on? And people will put you up there more than they will here. Cool. What are your thoughts on like say we you know say we find a teacher that we you know. This parent, okay. So we we reach out to them, say what, whatever the, their publications are, whatever. However, we contact them. And by the way, how do we find the parents of homeschool teacher homeschooling parents? Is there a list of that somewhere? Or um, like if you're not actually, it's really private. If you're not actually in a homeschooling program, you okay. can't get the information on right because okay. it's you know. But um, how would we reach them? Because that's a big question. Uh, Look, look, yeah, look for homeschooling groups. I would look for homeschooling groups. Facebook's still really popular because parents are older. Um, look for homeschooling groups and ask to join homeschooling groups or message the manager of a homeschooling group that this is what we've got and we're interested in helping people with this and it's open source. And what I would, what I would emphasize, okay, so if you're going to the parents directly, and that's not a bad idea, and I completely understand not wanting to go through the state folks. But, um, but if you're going to parents directly, then I would approach it as this is an entrepreneurial opportunity as well. It's not just a learning opportunity. It can be a self-paying learning opportunity. Oh, that gives me an idea. So what we should be pitching to the parents is that we're enlisting them into the OSC development course. And mm -hmm. this is for entrepreneurship where you start making real products and you make yourself yep. yeah. independent. Self-sufficiency. Mm-hmm. And it's off the grid. You can do it off the grid. Of course. You know that's that's really super important to a lot of homeschoolers. Uh huh. Uh, off grid, entrepreneurial. What else? Um. A lot of people are like trivia. 
classical education, so there's probably a way to apply it to that as well. Classical education, you mean like the classics that we don't read anymore? Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a trivium, uh, grammar, poetry, math, blah, I don't, I don't remember exactly. Yeah. Because it's been a few. Have you heard of Acton Academy, by the way? Because they're like focused I, super on entrepreneurial, uh, they're, they're homeschooling. Um, okay, that would be good, that would be good to approach. Any anybody entrepreneurial? But they're very yeah. entrepreneurial. That's who we should. Yeah, I need to talk to those mm -hmm. guys. Yeah, that's open source. And the yeah. thing is, is if somebody starts making money with an open source product, anybody can copy that business plan. Of course, it's not hard. You know, I mean, even if they don't publish their business plan, you can figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah I'm, Mark, I'm so excited about this, and I'm glad I'm like I'm enrolled full time in like the Linux and the Python and all that and it's I'm good it's to be helpful yeah yeah, yeah. nice oh I'm stoked <laughs> yeah that's great um let's see what other question do I have so if, okay how about this if, if um one more question here so mm -hmm. if we um go for you know say we end up finding teachers like say we say someone contacts us how would you suggest that we do, because we could do like a couple or four printers, like it's relatively easy to do that. If we're building one, we might as well build several, right? So mm -hmm. how would you get like groups of parents to do like, say four homeschooler groups? Are they typically like their density such that you'll find, if you find one, you can find a couple in the area or something or? Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, even when people, even when people are remote, even when they're in the bush, you know, if somebody's 20 miles away, they know how to get there. Yeah. You know, okay. you have, if you have kids, you have to have some kind of contact with another family. Yeah. Unless you're not, then you're not homeschooling. Unless you're completely uh, yeah. social. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, but they people like I, all my kids had cell phones because it was 15 miles to the nearest hockey rink, and there were two different hockey rinks, and they were 15 miles apart from each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and that's Alaska, cool. and three kids did hockey. That was it. You yeah, could yeah. do it. You with the distance interesting interesting okay so our next step then would be to look at uh, state programs and get ourselves you saying just get ourselves as the AVLs approved vendor list for those programs yes absolutely okay absolutely and, and I may not be the person to do that because I'm kind of abrasive <laughs> <laughs> okay so actually and, and I'll, 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 do the, I'll do the MTS right in the middle there you know, <laughs> 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 uh, so you okay. have to <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't come out online because I get to edit all that. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and get on AVL list. And Jen, by the way, so remember, so Jen was at the Oregon talk. Now, Jen, you remember the Hong Kong people we were talking to? Yes. I, yes. Absolutely. Well, I got invited, yeah, I got. In, they invited me, so I'm going like in two weeks. That's awesome. Oh, that is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. That is so awesome. Nice. Yeah, yeah they, they look like super nice. And you were so popular. Yeah, that was great. I was, I was there to share my catering skills. <laughs> yeah. I still, I still get a kick out of like telling people about that one lady handing me her like empty plates and stuff. And you looked at me like, oh my God, what's she going to do? And I was just, yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. That was great. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. Well, no, Jen, thanks so much this, on this homeschooling stuff. That, I think that's really useful, so we'll, we can uh, get on that action item there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really excited about it. Do we have an, elevator, an elevator's pitch yet? Uh, Alex, no. <laughs> what's our elevator pitch? Right. Something. Yeah, we, we'll, we need, we'll, yeah, we we'll, need we'll do elevator. that. We'll, we'll do yeah. a... Yeah, yeah, why don't we, like... Uh, you can post that on OSD Workshop's Facebook page, ask people. But, but I would say, yeah, let's come up with a good homeschoolers elevator pitch that, that kind of hits <clears throat> all the important keywords that they like to hear. That would be great. Yeah. 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 Can you start that on OSD Workshop's Facebook page? I can do it. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Excellent, gentles. Thanks for, so much for your time. And we'll uh, continue. So, everybody, yeah, I got to get going. I got to... Uh, do some stuff here and do this marketing stuff. So um, this was very useful. Sarah and Alex, that was a great thing with Nick. I think we got a lot of insight on that. That was really cool. That was, and we're so close to critical mass. Yeah, we're I'm like it's critical mass, and things are just really going to accelerate. We're yeah. going geometric.
I think, yeah, I think it's we're going to start it. Uh-huh. I think it started right here five weeks ago. 24 hours. Five weeks and 24 hours. Okay. Sounds Excellent. great. Okay, everybody. Bye, well, next thanks. Uh, we'll talk uh, talk soon. Okay. Great. Awesome. Bye, Sarah. Bye, Marchin. Bye, bye, Jen. Bye.